Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to have been invited to give this presentation about what I think is uh, basic facts about uh, mechanism and uh, environmental impact of process called global warming. <clears throat> First, I would like to share with you uh, some basic facts. So, global warming is basically the heating of the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth in, in total. Uh, in fact, uh, increase in Earth's atmosphere temperature, average temperature measured throughout the year. Uh, and, of course, corresponding climate changes resulting from the greenhouse effect. And what is the greenhouse effect? It is basically a shift in the equilibrium of radiating surplus heat that comes from the sun. As we know, sun heats the earth and uh, some of, as we shall see later, some of its radiation comes directly to the, through the atmosphere to the earth's surface. Uh, either is uh, absorbed in the sea or on the land mass, or it is uh, rebounded back towards the space. Some processes that have been changed since are shifting that re-emission re of the heat energy and it, has been, it is being trapped within our atmosphere resulting in increased heat and increasing of the temperature. And the uh, main causes are in the, in the atmosphere are uh, gases that are considered to be the main greenhouse gases. These are carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, and nitrous oxide, and ozone, and to always called the laughing gas. You know, when you go to the dentist, then they stuff you with that. So you don't feel anything. Uh, I'd like to, see, uh, to show you some basic numbers regarding these changes caused by uh, greenhouse effect. Atmospheric carbon, oh, sorry. Atmospheric carbon dioxide has been rising from since since it was measured systematically from 1957, from the 50s, from 312 ppm, which is which stands for parts per million, to little more than 400 ppm. Average global temperature has risen for about uh, one degree Celsius since systematic measurement in late 1980s, uh, 1980s, sorry, 1800s. Arctic ice is reducing by 13.2% per decade, and ice sheets are, it is estimate, that are losing some 413 gigatons per year of ice. Gigatons is 400. 13 followed by nine zeros. And sea level has risen in, uh, is rising globally for about 3.2 millimeters per year, which stands for 178 millimeters over past 100 years. Uh, what are the sources of heat that is heating the earth? One of the source is that the earth, earth's interior is really hot and melted. Uh, it is supposed to contain a solid but very hot iron and nickel core, which is not confirmed, but nevertheless, it has a very hot and, melting, and melted interior. Also, there is a second uh, source of uh, heat within the Earth, which is radioactive decay of radioisotopes, uranium, plutonium, potassium, and other. <coughs> But compared to the sun's radiation and sun's energy that reaches Earth, it is considered to be some 5,000 times smaller than what we receive, receive from the sun. So you can see that basically sun is the main and practically only heat source that uh, Earth receives. <clears throat> there are some theories about the causes of global warming process. Uh, this, uh, the problem is uh, 
from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, climatology and physical science, it is a super complex problem because the Earth is, has great mass, has a really big atmosphere which has its uh, inertia and uh, the equilibrium of heat transfer and uh, uh, re-emitting heat to the space is really, really complex one and there is no one solid theory about it. Though the majority of uh, scientific community concurs that we uh, reached the consensus that human activity increased carbon dioxide and methane, basically carbon dioxide and methane output in the atmosphere, which increases the greenhouse effect of the Earth's atmosphere. This in turn uh, releases larger amounts of water vapor, which also acts as a, a greenhouse gas. Thus, uh, contributing to the, uh, the principle of positive feedback. It increases more and more. Uh, there is a theory about the solar activity, which says that uh, solar activity uh, fluctuates, uh, in fact, oscillates over a period of 11 years now. In the past, it was 10 and a half years, and that, that was a uh, main reason for this increase in, in temperature of, of Earth's atmosphere and Earth's ocean. However, uh, exact data about rising of the temperature over 130 years, past 130 years, and corresponding uh, graph that shows intensity of the sun shows the discrepancy. While the temperature is rising, the sun activity doesn't increase that much. It oscillates in a period of 10 years, 11 years. However, it does not increase to support this theory. And of course, there are a really myriad of theories, usually uh, conspiratorial theories, about the greenhouse effect and the, the heating of the Earth. Uh, uh, just to explain this, this graphical representation of energy budget of, of Earth receiving the heat from the sun. So solar radiation, which can be measured approximately around 340-350 watts per meter square of Earth, uh, when it enters the uh, Earth's atmosphere, some of it goes directly and is absorbed directly into the Earth's surface, being that solid surface of continents or the sea, while some is reflected directly from the clouds and goes back to the space, and some of it, a small percent, is reflected from the very surface of the Earth. When this uh, energy is absorbed, it can be re-radiated into the atmosphere uh, as a long-wave radiation or heat radiation. Some of this radiation is also trapped in the clouds and re-emitted back to the Earth or emitted from the clouds to the outer atmosphere and to the space. And it's lost as energy uh, for the Earth. Uh, water vapor in, in atmosphere can, can act as a greenhouse gas because as a vapor, it can increase the absorption of this heat energy and re-emit it in all directions, one of, the, one of which is uh, towards the surface of the Earth again, or around it, the, the particle of water vapor, and then increases the heat of the atmosphere. But if the water vapor is dense enough that uh, it uh, forms the clouds, it can serve as a sort of a reflective shield for the, uh, for the sun's uh, radiation to uh, re-emit it back into the space. So this is a really, really simplified, uh, simplified uh, representation of, of main paths of energy that is radiated towards the Earth and back from the Earth's atmosphere. <coughs> as we know, uh, global warming as such 
uh, increase of the temperature has to have some effect on the climatic processes, global climatic processes and local climatic processes, of course, because uh, the climatic changes are, in fact, we'll see later, in fact, the transfer of energy. Energy is being transferred from one place to another, from higher state to lower state, and the different energy containing uh, parts of atmosphere, when in contact, they, uh, they exchange energy, and that creates all climatic phenomena that we know, from winds, hurricanes, uh, downdrafts of very cold air, precipitation, and so on. Uh, these are graphs that are showing uh, systematic measurements and the data gathered to, through these systematic measurements since 1850s. And it says that global land and ocean temperature indexes, this is, this is average annual temperature, has risen, you see, this is a just relative point. This is not zero, percent, zero degree centigrade. Celsius. This is a relative point from the first measurements and from that point there has been slight drop and constant increase in atmospheric, atmospheric uh, and ocean, oceanic temperature. You see through 140 years, 140 years, yes. Uh, this is a graph that shows temperature anomaly. It is called temperature anomaly, this rise of the temperature. Uh, over land and over ocean, you see that land has a little bit more rise in, in its temperature index than the ocean, because the ocean is, because of its size and volume, has, is very good buffer for the temperature. Uh, this graph depicts uh, concentration of carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere measured all over the, the world. You see this is, these are uh, institutes uh, or stations that are measuring from Canada to Italy to Mauna Loa in, in Hawaii Islands. And you can also see the steady and intensive increase in the CO2 content of the atmosphere. This uh, jagged line represents uh, the parts of the year where because of the uh, because of the, f uh, I forgot the word, the word, because of the, when, the, when there's a, what's it called, that that had the, uh, vegetation season of, of green coverage of the earth, produces or, uh, produces more or less, not produces, but uh, uh, uses more, absorbs and, and uses more or less CO2 because as we know plant life uses CO2 as a building base of its macromolecules. Basically CO2, water and also energy from the sun. And this jagged line represents uh, parts of year when there is a higher concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and the other part of year without the vegetation season, with the vegetation season, that lowers somewhat CO2. But unfortunately, this doesn't, this doesn't affect this uh, trend of rise of the atmospheric CO2. And this is the graph that shows us uh, also uh, the levels of other uh, uh, greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide. These data are, you see, the years are there is a very big span of years. Uh, more um, majority of this data is uh, uh, indirectly uh, obtained through the through the either geochemical analysis or chemical analysis of uh, sediments or seawater or remnants of uh, living organisms that incorporate these these elements into their bodies. <coughs> What, what kind of impact on the environment has the greenhouse effect and uh, global warming? Most obvious are loss of polar ice, 
shrinking and melting of glaciers, which is really considerable in some parts of the world, rising of the sea level, and we all know that majority of human population lives within, I think, 50 kilometers of the global shoreline. Yeah. Uh, some ar areas, which means uh, the living space of uh, many plant and animal species, are shifting because of this heating of the atmosphere in the ocean. And of course, this is most obvious in retreating lines of subarctic boreal forests of the north because these plants do not tolerate very well uh, higher temperature. You know, the white bark of the birch tree, it serves as a heat insulator. The white color reflects the sun and the plant doesn't heat up that fast in the, in the spring and it, it allows it, the birch tree to to gather the, the macromolecular basis of, of growth. Uh, there is also an impact on the climatic system of the Earth, which, which shakes down or shakes delicate balance of energy and heat distribution that drives the climatic processes. Uh, though I said earlier that Earth has an, some inertia and this cannot be seen immediately. However, the climate is shifting and uh, after a period of several decades it will be really, really obvious that what has happened. Uh, basically, what, what, what is going on with the climate? Because of the redistribution of heat, some, uh, some uh, processes are either shifted from one place to another or intensify in their nature, so we have as an effect longer and more intense heat waves uh, as, and as rain depends on the temperature difference, where hot air contains more water vapor than cold one, when the air containing vapor cools, cools it releases uh, the moisture or the water as, as a precipitation, being that rain or snow. And, uh, this, uh, this uh, climate change, is, change uh, is, can be seen in the redistribution of rain areas where more rainfalls and heavier grass uh, dry periods are shifted from one place to another. Uh, as re the, result, the resulting wildfires from the, from the dry areas, of course, are much more destructive and the hurricanes that are characteristic for ocean systems of Atlantic Ocean and southern coast of the United States are being at least a principle of hurricane operation has been seen even in, in other parts of the world. Now we come to the Mediterranean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. You know, the Adriatic Sea is the northernmost part of the Mediterranean Sea and, it's, and it is linked with its uh, conveyor of seawater with, with the Mediterranean Sea. These are the temperatures, uh, the temperature of atmosphere for the Mediterranean Sea uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. In, the, in the period of 1880 to 1999, I suppose. Uh, yeah. The globe temperature rise is shown in green and Mediterranean is in, in blue. Because of the Mediterranean Sea is positioned between very really hot and arid Africa and Europe, there, and because of the fact that there is no really much of the influx of river waters in the Mediterranean Sea, Mediterranean Sea is, uh, has larger evaporation than than the global ocean and is in fact usually a little bit lower if precisely measured than Atlantic Ocean just across the Gibraltar Strait because the evaporation is larger than of the Atlantic Ocean and because of that the increase in temperature is somewhat higher instead of 1 degree centigrade it is some 1.4 degrees centigrade. 
Uh, see, this analysis of long-term trends in the Mediterranean region show that annual mean of the temperature condition is having a trend to be warmer and drier. So basically, it is going to be, to be hotter here. Uh, some information about, you see, Vicente Serrano et al. in 2014 showed that frequency and intensity of drafts, dry spells, have increased significantly in the Mediterranean area since 1950. Uh, they, they basically say that though there is an increase in draft uh, periods, there is important regional differences because, you know, from place to place, there are different climatic, microclimatic uh, influences, and which shows in more or less dry time. Adriatic Sea. Adriatic Sea. Uh, information about uh, s uh, surface standard surface temperature says that it has risen by 1.8 degrees centigrade Celsius in the past 60 years. Uh, you know that compared to the Mediterranean, Adriatic is really uh, shallow sea with the mean depth in the northern part, I don't know, less than 100 meters, less than 100 meters, which in turn, uh, uh, which in turn heats and cools much faster than deeper seas. Adriatic Sea, as a part of the Mediterranean Sea, will for surely be under the influence of the sea level of the Mediterranean Sea. And you can show the trend. Uh, this is a record made by Croatian Geographic Institute in which says from 1955 to 1995, the mean water level and maximum and minimum water levels measured by mariographs in Split, which shows rather stable trend of the level of the Adriatic Sea. <clears throat> but nevertheless, uh, they, they noted some increase of the level of Adriatic Sea in the past maybe 20 years, 30 years. This is a representation of a water regime that feeds the Adriatic Sea with the waters from Ionian Sea. And the system is called B BIOS, or BIOS. It's uh, Adriatic Ionian B-model oscillating system. B-model because it has two ways of, uh, of conveying water masses, either counter, counterclockwise or uh, cyclonal movement that feeds to the Adriatic Sea directly water from the eastern Mediterranean and anti or clockwise movement that feeds a much larger portion of West, Med West Mediterranean and Atlantic, basically, basically Atlantic surface waters to the Adriatic Sea. Mm. There are some there are some differences between the, uh, one or the other uh, mode of transport water transportation, and that influences the possible redistribution of uh, planktonic or nectonic species that are entering the Adriatic Sea. Uh, I would like to say something about biological effects of global warming that can be shown for the Adriatic Sea. Uh, our university, where I work, and some colleagues are here also, uh, they conducted a study that is called Mediterranean something like that. Yeah. Influence of the Thermohaline Circulation Variations in the Eastern and Central Mediterranean on the plankton communities of Southern Adriatic with ecological and genetical approach. And uh, I was given this uh, graph that represents the measurements of temperature of the waters in the mid-layer 
mid-layer between 200 and 800 meters of depth in South Adriatic. And you can clearly see, although this is, uh, these temperatures are oscillating, there is a clear trend of increase of the temperature since 1985 until basically present today. Uh, for the Adriatic Sea, our colleague that will be working on this uh, project of identifying uh, influences on the plantar communities, they discovered some, some species from warm waters that have entered uh, Adriatic waters, uh, some of which are this tunicate that comes from the Indian Ocean, also another tunicate, Thalia orientalis from the Pacific Ocean, and Medusa uh, neobia dendrotentaculata, which comes from the Atlantic Ocean. Am I right? Atlantic Ocean, yeah. Some of these uh, are, this particular is warm water species, and that means that there are some uh, circumstances in the Arctic Sea that allow it to grow and to establish population, which means, and indirectly, that basically sea is getting warmer. Mm. This, uh, this graph that I showed here, the change from cyclonal to anticyclonal uh, uh, movement and conveying of the waters to the Adriatic Sea was probably the driving force be behind introduction of at least some of the plantonic species that are found new in the Adriatic Sea. Also, uh, under that ADMET plant project, two in the Pacific diatoms were recorded, sorry, recorded for the Adriatic waters. Two species belonging to the genus Hepaceras, one is from in the Pacific species, widely distributed, and the other is rather rare even in the Indian Ocean. These are also warm water species. Uh, further evidence of the biological changes that are taking place probably because of the global warming in the Adriatic Sea are the shift of the uh, living area of uh, some fish populations that are, that are being found more and more to the north of the Adriatic Sea than before. For example, Pomatomus saltatrix, species that was really discovered for Istrian waters maybe 20 years ago, and it can, it can appear in uh, really, really large shoals. This is predatory species, uh, but haven't been recorded for the northern Adriatic before. Corifena hippurus mahi mahi is also one species that is species that is radiating its area towards the north, as well as Thalassoma pavo. This is ornate grass. It is well known in our waters here near the Gronic, but in the Mediterranean, the uh, Adriatic, it's a different story. Also, Parisoma cretense and Epinephilus coioides, which is only spotted grouper. This is a totally new species to the Mediterranean and to the Adriatic. It is uh, radiated, I think, from the Red Sea and from the Indian Ocean. These are also uh, hot water species, warm water species. Uh, I, will, I don't want to mention all the species that have been uh, discovered in the past 20, 30 years in the Mediterranean because it's a really large number of fish, mollusks and crustaceans that have uh, radiated towards the north, towards the Mediterranean. Uh, the vector for these species is clearly the Suez Canal and these are called Lesepsia migrants. Uh, all the exception species. Uh, and finally, the effect that uh, these, uh, that these uh, newcomer species can have on the indigenous life in the Adriatic Sea is competition for food and space or predatory relations of these newcomer species with, uh, with local species. And uh, the reaction of local species Population, populations of local species is usually either shifting spawning grounds to different locations or reduction in population size. So you see that the impact can be 
It can vary in intensity, but can be great. One, uh, one example is, it's not from the Adriatic, but it's a drastic uh, example. For example, the Bay of, uh, uh, Bay of Los Angeles, you know. San Francisco. I, think. I got a momentary lapse of reason. Uh, uh, Bay of San Francisco has received via uh, transfer from uh, ballast waters from the ships a few species of uh, copepod uh, crabs from, I think, Chinese waters. Until that point, there was maybe 30 or 40 species of different copepod. Uh, planktonic crabs, uh, processions in the San Francisco Bay, and when these two or three species arrived, after a few years, basically it was only one or two newcomer species that have uh, left, and the local species were wiped out. <clears throat> say and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Riksha. It's time for our talk show. Have a seat, please. Any questions? You know the procedure. We start with the questions. If you don't have, I always have questions. Anybody? Okay, I will start. You were talking about uh, new things in Adriatic Sea. Uh, I can see new fish uh, in Adriatic Sea and everybody's talking. That was not ever before. Uh, that just started a few years ago. How many new uh, type of fish do we have here at, at the Dubrovnik area, this area? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly if the newcoming uh, species are only, can only be found in Dubrovnik area or broader in the Adriatic, but I think several dozens of species, uh, fish species have been discovered in the Adriatic Sea that haven't been seen or recorded before, scientifically recorded. Some of these species are Mediterranean species that have radiated their area into the Adriatic. So basically these species are not that much foreign than, than the real exception species or species coming from the Atlantic Ocean that have also been recorded for the Adriatic Sea. For example, the, the, the latest is this Lagocephalus celeratus, which is a puffer fish. You know, the poisonous one. There is a lot of, a lot of talk has been about this species. A few, few specimens have been found. Uh, it's, uh, it's similar to uh, Fugu, the term of Fugu. It is somewhat poisonous, uh, but not very much. Though I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> so not deadly by touch, but if you eat it, that's a different story. I don't like uh, those fishes who are not uh, friendly. Of course, we don't like medusas, but we have them. Yeah. Well, me, uh, we me always had it, but yes. Now we have something different. Do we? Yeah, yes. Also, uh, Clidarian species are uh, recorded anew in the Adriatic Sea. I'm not, uh, I'm not an ethnologist and I don't deal with Medusa, but I can, I can only say that some species have been discovered anew. And uh, since Medusa, uh, Medusa or these types of Clidaria have peculiar uh, type of metagenetic life cycle, it is, it's not likely that you would see a lot of medusas every day in the sea. They come like in a room and then they sort of disappear. The findings or sightseeing will be seen will be sporadic, not, not every day. Okay, anybody want to join us to talk? Okay. Oh, don't worry. So we always hear that the indigenous species are brought in also by cruise ships, and you mentioned the example in the States with the crabs from the yeah. water from ships, but you're now mentioning only global warming. So is it mainly global warming, the rise of the temperature of the sea, or maybe species coming in from different ships? 
Sorry, I, I don't think I understood the question. You, you were asking if the uh, cruise ships are, are yeah, if the cruise ships and their ballast waters are uh, bringing new species. Yes. Probably, probably, probably they are. But uh, this uh, kind of transport is uh, uh, only can be applied on either larval stages or planktonic organisms, not larger, larger species. You know very small ones. But this is the portion of redistribution of the species globally, not just in, in Croatia and in Adriatic waters. And comparing that to San Francisco story? Well, it's, it's, the, the, I, I mentioned the San Francisco story because it's really, uh, really the worst type of scenario uh, when, you, when you bring uh, non-indigenous species into the a body of water, you know, with, with local species. But probably something will happen in, in the Adriatic Sea regarding uh, some species local, because you know, uh, uh, a species or a uh, fish species or platonic species doesn't live alone. It lives in the uh, in, uh, environment along with other species and has interactions. These interactions can be from non-existing to Amenzal, it's called Amenzalism, but when two species are having the same place to live but do not affect one another uh, much, to Commenzal or predatory when one attacks the other, either for food or, or usually for food. So the gradation of this uh, impact can be from mild to loss of species, of course. Okay, anybody else? Yes? Well, uh, you are coming from this institute and I think that I can uh, put you this question. Do you uh, think that uh, the last uh, water from uh, the coast, which is uh, today coming to the Bay of Small Stone, which is protected uh, like uh, a nature uh, protected reservoir, uh, do you think that it is the reason also of a climate change that we have less uh, rainwater, less underground water, that uh, uh, much uh, well, uh, less water last 10 years is coming to Bay of Small Stone and it is very important to have uh, that uh, eco system in a balance as it was before. Uh, what is the reason why we have uh, some changes in that protected uh, uh, ecosystem in Bale or Small Stone? It is also connected with uh, climate changes, what do you think? Or some uh, human works in the backside of the uh, Browning and Vacanti. Well, can we uh, make some connection with uh, the climate changes? What do you think? Uh, Yes, some, some portion of the problem with Manistone Bay can be addressed to the, probably to the climate change because of, uh, of that kind of change. Uh, uh, less rain falls and less rain water seeps through the, through the calcium carbonate bedrock and comes into the Manistone Bay as underwater springs. You know that this kind of uh, water influx brings with itself uh, sediment, rich in nutrients, and organic salts. They are basically fueling primary production, phytoplanktonic production, and in turn, zooplankton can uh, basically sustains the whole, the whole uh, ecosystem of Madison Bay, which is rather rich, and because of that richness, it allows a large amount of shellfish to be cultured in it. And the other part is uh, less water comes from directly from Neretva River for two parts. One is that uh, several dams have been built on the Neretva River since 1950s, which greatly reduced its water influx into the sea. And the other thing is uh, the sandy, uh, like a beach, it's sandy, uh, it's like an obstacle. It's called Shkaram, to the southern part of the Neretva River mouth of the sea. It 
used to function as the water deflector. It made whirling of the water and then one portion of that water would go to the Mariston Bay. And now, since it's gone, Neretva basically takes all the water on the surface directly to the sea. Okay. Anybody else? One more question. Uh, you said that the sea is going to be uh, hotter in next year. Now we start to swim at May. We will swim till October, some of us till November. Maybe we will have a New Year's Eve in the sea next year. What do you think about that? Well, uh, the sea has a lot of inertia in, in, in buffering the temperature rise, so you can't expect that the water will rise in temperature within five years in, or, or 10 degrees Celsius. But uh, the, the increase is evident. And as you said, uh, there, is, there has been increase in, in this uh, season of baiting from May to almost November. Well, it's individual, you know, some people do swim on the New Year's Eve. I wouldn't. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dear guests, we did a really good job for our first day. As we are talking about sea, uh, you still have a chance to check temperature of the sea today. Uh, tomorrow we start at 9 o'clock with registration. We have five very interesting presentations and the details are available in the agenda. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you.